Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and we are his, his people, and the flock of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Give thanks unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy endureth forever, and his faithfulness unto all generations. Happy Thanksgiving! If you can believe it, it is once again that time of year, time for the Young Heretics Thanksgiving special. It's also, of course, time for actual Thanksgiving, uh, one of our most maligned holidays. Last year when we did our Thanksgiving special, I talked all about why Thanksgiving is so hateful to our new cultural trend setters, to what is sometimes called the cathedral or the kind of, you know, cultural and political uh, people who, who run our most powerful institutions. So if you want to hear my take on all of that, if you want to go back to last year's episode, you'll hear, you know, what, what I believe to be the real story of how uh, the pilgrims, which is to say a group of separatists who were reformers of the Anglican Church, broke off from the Church of England, uh, traveled first to Leiden in the Netherlands, and then on to the New World to set up what they believed was going to be basically the kingdom of heaven on earth or some small part of it. They wanted to live their lives the way they wanted to live them. Uh, or more specifically, they didn't want to just do anything at all. They wanted to uh, act out, live out their faith as they believed it to be. They were hardcore Protestants. Their enemies called them Puritans, um, which of course was a sort of pejorative that was used at this time for people that wanted to strip the church of its kind of later additions, its ritual, its ceremony, its pomp and circumstance, and just get back down to basics, back to the way that early Christian church lived. So the Puritans, uh, or rather the pilgrims who were separatists, um, wanted to live that belief out. They couldn't do it under King James in England. They suffered persecution, which we're going to talk about. Um, and then they underwent an incredibly difficult voyage to the New World, um, where they happened upon, in, in Plymouth at their plantation, they happened upon um, a, a fellow named Squanto. We call him Squanto, or Tisquantum was his his real name. Um, and uh, Tisquantum was, was serving as an interpreter for Massasoit, the chief um, of another tribe. Squanto had been sold into slavery. He'd made his way back. Uh, he was liberated by Catholic priests, uh, made his way back to the New World, um, and emerged, basically, out of the woods like some miracle to guide the pilgrims uh, through their their very, very difficult winter. Um, and, and the Indians, too, were under terrible stress. They had suffered a plague. Uh, they called it the Great Dying. Um, and the two of them made this pact, very moving pact, to defend one another um, and to live in harmony on the land. That's the story of the first Thanksgiving. I talked about why it's absurd uh, to accuse this of some kind of, you know, European imperialism or to, you know, shrug, shrug it off as somehow evil. It's just part of our story, a beautiful part of our story that stands out against the normal human backdrop of uh, bloody warfare and, and uh, turmoil. I was observing earlier, um, you know, when they make these pronouncements now, like, oh, this event is occurring um, on land that was originally owned by the Wampanoag Indians or whatever. They make these, they're called land acknowledgments or something of that nature. You know, you have to confess your sin of having taken this land. Um, but one of the things I was noticing is that they always have to name like 10 different tribes in those uh, confessions for like one patch of land. So you're standing in some building and it's like, you know, well, it was this, these, this tribe and this tribe and this tribe. Why do you think that is? It's because the Indian tribes were warring over that land. This is a human perennial for tribes, different groups of people to fight over territory. Um, it also happened when the Europeans came to the new world. Um, there's nothing to apologize for in that. And there is much to celebrate in the ending of that territorial struggle in the uh, founding of what would eventually become the American 
nation, a newly peaceful and prosperous nation. Um, if you don't want to celebrate that because you think there are, you know, some kind, there's some kind of unique evil in it, um, then you have to scrap American history and America, right? There's no middle ground here. You don't get some alternative history to invent. Um, you only get the history that we have, which is complicated and messy and riddled with sin, like all human action is, um, but against the backdrop of which there shine these beautiful moments like what we call the first Thanksgiving. So that's my brief pitch uh, for not canceling Thanksgiving. I think it's completely ridiculous to want to do so. It's a hugely ignorant and arrogant thing to do, um, and we should treat it as such. However, I actually don't want to talk about that part of it this time. I talked about it last year at, at some length, um, but I, I think we kind of miss when we talk specifically just about that one interaction, which is amazing. Um, sometimes we miss the rest of the story of the pilgrims, um, which is an amazing story. You know, there's all this kind of nonsense going around now about like, you know, when, when conservatives protest against CRT or racial indoctrination in, in schools, um, the kind of race tribalists will come back and say, no, no, we, you know, you just don't want to teach about slavery. You don't want to teach about Americans history with race. Um, and I don't know about you, but I learned plenty about slavery and America's history with race in school. Uh, there was no concealing that compl complexity. Um, nobody lied to me about it. But you know what I didn't read? What I wasn't taught about in school are the amazing documents that we have from this journey, this little group of people, kind of scrappy Protestants, um, making their way against all odds and in the face of incredible danger, making their way to the new world. So I want to tell you some of that story today. That's the story I'm going to tell because that's the real thing that I think we're not talking about, we're not acknowledging, is what it took to settle the new world. You guys, I'm inviting you to join the revolution and become part of the solution to our broken education system with the Albertus Magnus Institute. These guys are proudly free, proudly unaccredited, and offer the best instruction out there on the great traditions of the good, the true, and the beautiful. Their Magnus Fellowship is entirely free. It's live, online, and interactive, which means you can do it from home and become immersed in the great traditions in the tradition of their founder, Albert the Great, known for his work on the highest good. Everything that we love and pursue and talk about on this show, the Albertus Magnus Institute teaches about in their free fellowship. Discover why the Magnus Fellowship is the fastest growing liberal arts learning community in the world and apply to become a Magnus Fellow right now at magnusinstitute.org forward slash heretics. I'm going to say that link again because you've got to use that one in order to get a free gift. magnusinstitute.org forward slash heretics. You guys, this is perfect for lifelong learners. And I know from interacting with all of you that that is what you all are. Anybody who listens to this show can benefit from the kind of instruction you get in the Magnus Fellowship. Really wonderful opportunity to take your education further. Apply to become a Magnus Fellow. Get a free gift. One more time, magnusinstitute.org forward slash H-E-R-E-T-I-C-S. Go check it out. Okay, so like I said, the pilgrims as we call them, were, they, they, they called themselves that. They said they knew they were pilgrims. Um, they were uh, a pretty radical sect of Protestants. England at this point is, you know, is itself a Protestant nation under King James. It's got the Church of England. Um, they've gone through the persecutions, the Catholic persecutions under uh, Queen Mary, Bloody Mary. Um, and now under under King James, there it's the Church of England, but it's still too Catholic uh, for the separatists. These guys are really hard line. You know, they're, they're the Protestants, Protestants. And that's another reason why I wanted to talk about them today, because I've been doing a lot of like pro-Catholic content lately. Um, I'm big Though not a Catholic myself, a big defender of, of Catholicism against the attacks that Protestants sometimes uh, raise against it. Um, and we've been doing a ton on St. Thomas More and uh, the freedom of conscience that he advocated um, and the fact that, in fact, he and Luther were working out in some ways the same idea. Um, but now I want to pull a little bit for Team Protestant. I want to just stand in awe of the conviction that it took uh, for this group of people to face persecution after persecution after persecution. And the guy that you have to to really uh, know about um, in this story is a fellow named William Bradford, because it's his 
uh, sort of annals of the experience, his yearly documenting of, of Plymouth Plantation um, that gives us a lot of this story. William Brad Bradford, born in 1590 in England, um, Yorkshire, which is the north, so he's a northerner. The northerners are tough, man. You know, this is the part of England that has often been either neglected or economically impoverished. Um, Bradford was an orphan, uh, and and so he, he had to essentially kind of turn um, inward for spiritual strength. He was, he was pretty sickly. So he had a lot of time to, to read the text, read the Bible, reflect. Um, and, and he became, you know, a convicted separatist along with groups that were growing up at that time in England. Um, and so I'm going to read to you just from the very beginning of his, of his work, um, of his record of this time, just to give you a sense of the, the fire of his worldview, the passion with which he deplored both the Catholic Church and then he, what he thought of as the excesses of the Catholic Church that had made their way also into the Church of England. Um, so here, here he is. Here's William Bradford. It is well known unto the godly and judicious how ever since the first breaking out of the light of the gospel in our honorable nation of England, which was the first of nations whom the Lord adorned therewith, after that gross darkness of popery which had covered and overspread the Christian world, what wars and oppositions ever since Satan hath raised, maintained, and continued against the saints from time to time in one sort or another, sometimes by bloody death and cruel torments, other whiles imprisonments, banishments, and other hard usages, as being loath his kingdom should go down, the truth prevail, and the churches of God revert to their ancient purity and recover their primitive order, liberty, and beauty. So he's saying the minute the gospel was preached, Satan did everything he could to distort it and keep it in the dark, um, including establish that foul uh, institution of popery, the, uh, the institution, the formalized institution of the Catholic Church. But when he, that is, when Satan, could not prevail by these means against the main truths of the gospel, but that they began to take rooting in many places, being watered with the blood of the martyrs, and blessed from heaven with a gracious increase, he then began to take him to his ancient stratagems, used of old against the first Christians, that when by the bloody and barbarous persecutions of the heathen emperors he could not stop and subvert the course of the gospel, but that it speedily overspread with a wonderful clarity the then best-known parts of the world, he then began to sow errors, heresies, and wonderful dissensions amongst the professors themselves, working upon their pride and ambition with other corrupt passions incident to all mortal men, yea, to the saints themselves in some measure, by which woeful effects followed, as not only bitter, contentious, and heart-burning schisms with other horrible confusions, but Satan took occasion and advantage thereby to foist in a number of vile ceremonies with many unprofitable canons and decrees which have since been as snares to many poor and peaceable souls, even to this day. So as in the ancient times, the persecutions by the heathen and their emperors was not greater than of the Christians one against another, the Arians and other their accomplices against the Orthodox and true Christians. Man, people wrote back in those days. I mean, this, this guy can really, uh, can really get up into a rhetorical froth and say whatever else you will about him. You know, maybe you find some of these accusations against the Catholic Church unfair. I think I, I probably do. I think they go a little bit overboard. Um, but say what you will about them. This guy is punching up and he has the courage of his convictions, right? This is not like he's, he's not railing against some persecuted minority here. He is the persecuted minority. Him and and his band of, of uh, brethren, right, um, who are developing uh, essentially a presbytery government. That is, they want to uh, choose their own local leaders in a manner that would have enormous influence over the um, over the American government itself. We're going to get to that in a bit, right? The uh, the development of America's government is rooted in this um, religious, this this fiery religious movement, this desire um, to follow out the simplicity and the truth of the of your conscience in relation to Scripture as you see it. Um, that's what Bradford is going to live and die for. And he has a band um, of a group of, of accomplices in this. And one of the reasons why I want to bring all of this up and why I read that psalm at the beginning, that was Psalm 100, right? Um, Enter into his courts with praise, um, is that we miss sometimes when we, when we talk all about the, you know, the, the Thanksgiving at Plymouth, we miss the fact that 
a thanksgiving is a religious act. It's a, it's a prayer of thanks to God. This is a duty in the Bible. It's a duty to rejoice. It's a duty to pray. Um, and, and it's a duty to give thanks. Now, of course, rejoicing and giving thanks are themselves joyous things, right? But we need to be reminded of them. Um, and we need to have this uh, sense of awe, right, at the things, the good things that come to us, knowing that they are not guaranteed. So that's what Thanksgiving is about. Um, the, the quote unquote first Thanksgiving is in that sense, not actually the first Thanksgiving. This, uh, the arrival of the, of the pilgrims came after the real first Thanksgiving and people in Virginia get very mad at this because in, in Virginia, there had already been, um, a ceremony of Thanksgiving for settlement of, of the new world. Now, of course, this pilgrim story is still the one that fascinates us and draws our attention, but it's, it's, coming out of, it's welling up really from this passionate engagement with Christian scripture um, and delight in the the, the purity of, of scriptural truth. Um, and so here's how Bradford tells us uh, the the pilgrims ended up having to flee England uh, in, in defense of this truth. That is, you know, they were willing to be persecuted for it um, and they were willing to leave everything behind uh, in order to make a better life for themselves. All my bros out here, I feel concerned that your face might look gross. And if it does, you need to use Disco products. Actually, you should check out Disco even if you don't think that your face looks gross. Although, you know, your your lady friend might not be telling you. Anyway, Disco is skincare for men. And I think guys are really antsy or weirded out by skincare. Uh, just that word feels like it's for girls. It's really not. I mean, you should care how you look. You should have a presentable appearance at a job interview, on a date, whatever. Um, and, and Disco's stuff is specifically geared to guys, the problems that guys have. Dry skin, razor burn, uh, bags under your eyes. Disco makes this like stick, this kind of roller stick that you just roll onto your eyes and it suddenly like brightens you up. It's really good. Um, I, I actually used it right before I started filming this episode so that I would not look like my typical sleep deprived lizard person face. Um, so if you want to check them out, I highly recommend it. They're an Austin based company, um, which is great out in that good red state of Texas. And they're vegan. If you want to check out Disco and try their incredible skincare products, we have a great offer. It's 30% off when you use the offer code heretics at letsdisco.com. 30% is huge. Uh, don't usually get that much out of folks. So go to letsdisco.com and use heretics and check out for 30% off your first order. So like I said, pilgrims are called separatists because they separate off, they make their own church, um, churches actually, um, and this is not to be born under the J uh, Jacobian regime or the Jacobean regime, that is King James's regime. Um, he vows to harry them out, and here's what Bradford has to say about this. He says, after these things, that is after the founding of their own church, um, they could not long continue in any peaceable condition, but were hunted and persecuted on every side. So as their former afflictions were but as flea bitings in comparison of these which now came upon them. For some were taken and clapped up in prison, others had their houses beset and watched night and day, and hardly escaped their hands, and the most were fain to fly and leave their houses and habitations and the means of their livelihood. Yet these and many other sharper things which afterward befell them were no other than they looked for, and therefore were the better prepared to bear them by the assistance of God's grace and spirit." Yet, seeing themselves thus molested, and that there was no hope of their continuance there, by a joint consent, they resolved to go into the low countries, where they had heard was freedom of religion for all men, as also how sundry from London and other parts of the land had been exiled and persecuted for the same cause, and were gone thither, and lived at Amsterdam in other places of the land. So, after they had continued together about a year, and kept their meetings every Sabbath in one place or another, exercising the worship of God amongst themselves, notwithstanding all the diligence and malice of their adversaries, they seeing they could no longer continue in that condition, they resolved to get over to Holland as they could, which was in the year 1607. So remember, we're, we're telling the story that leads up here to 1620, which is uh, the landing at, at Plymouth Rock. Um, Holland, they've heard of Holland as a kind of refuge for religious dissidents, people seeking freedom of religion. Um, they are ready to endure persecution, but they know that this can't go on. And so they head to the Netherlands uh, and to Leiden. Um, note also that they make this decision by joint decree. This is a governing theme in Bradford's description. And like I said, this is a, the way that these guys want to do things. Um, they're, they're always 
seeking after the state of the early Christian church. And to some extent, I think I've, I've talked about this before, but let me just read a passage from the book of Acts in the New Testament. This comes after the Gospel of Luke. It's thought to be written by the same guy. Um, this is Acts chapter 4, describing how the disciples, after Jesus' resurrection and his ascension into heaven, um, how they set about preaching the gospel to all nations and developing this new faith in uh, light of as, as Bradford points out, in light of this same kind of state persecution that is on the run from government uh, authorities. Here's Acts chapter 4, starting at verse 32. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of what was sold, and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Now, as you can probably guess, right, lefties who read this passage are going to want to say, oh, look, they were communists, right? That is, they, they shared everything in common. Um, and to me, I think that is almost exactly the wrong lesson at a, at a political level to take out of this passage for, the, for this simple reason, right? This is all going on in the Roman provinces of the ancient world, right? And it's, so it's only in the context of a government where people have some control over their own possessions that it means anything at all that the Christians are, are sharing their possessions amongst themselves. Nobody has any objection to communities in which people share their, their uh, belongings. What we have an objection to is state-enforced sharing, right? That is, the government takes what you have, centralizes it, and claims that it will then give it out to other people, although that part never quite uh, seems to materialize. But in any case, right, this is, this is not really an argument for communism so much as an argument for community unity within the context of a government that gives you control over your own possessions. The lesson that we should be drawing from this is that directly from this story about the apostles, about sharing everything in common, about the communal life, um, we get this pilgrim ethos, this idea among the separatists that they are going to make these decisions together, share their life in as intimate a way as possible, um, and suffer together, indeed, as well as they rejoice and, and give thanks together. Another thing that people sometimes say, which I think is really wrong, is that, like, you know, America, because it is a nation in which there is freedom to worship, right, because the state does not establish any sect um, as the official sect, um, therefore what we really are is this kind of um, Enlightenment era um, neutral establishment, neutral country with no uh, religious roots or, or no, um, you know, there, there are no religious principles um, inherent in, in America. This story shows that the opposite is true, right? You can't have um, the inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and you can't have a government of, of representatives um, without this distinctively Christian ethic, right? This idea that by holding everything in common, um, we're going to go back to the basics of the church and out of our mutual love for one another. I've talked before about the fact that love and civic friendship is a core part of America, even before the Constitution. It's pre-constitutional in, in the big C sense, right? This is the groundwork being laid here for what would eventually become this uh, nation that we have now still <laughs> hanging by a thread, right? Um, and, and so this is what they are trying to create. They're trying to find a place where they can freely do this. Um, and uh, after some, some difficulties, they make their way to Holland, where they're basically able to uh, live as they please without persecution. And they, there's a beautiful description of how they were able to um, set this kind of life up in, in Leiden, where they stayed, he says, for 11 to 12 years. So I'm, I'm on now to chapter three of this narrative. Um, Bradford writes, being thus settled after many difficulties, they continued many years in a comfortable condition, enjoying much sweet and delightful society and spiritual comfort together in the ways of God under the able ministry and prudent government of Mr. John Robinson and Mr. William Brewster. Brewster's kind of this elder in the community whose descendants are still living in America today. There are, there are still descendants of, of William Brewster uh, mucking about. So, uh, Mr. William Brewster, who was an assistant unto Robinson in the place of an elder, unto which he was now called and chosen by the church. So, as they grew in knowledge and other gifts and graces of the Spirit of God, and lived together in peace and love and holiness, and many came unto them from diverse parts of England, so that they grew a great congregation. 
And if at any time any differences arose or offenses broke out, as it cannot be, but some time there will, even amongst the best of men, they were ever so met with and nipped in the head betimes, or otherwise so well composed, as still love, peace, and communion was continued, or else the church purged of those that were incurable and incorrigible, when, after much patience used, no other means would serve, which seldom came to pass. Yea, such was the mutual love and reciprocal respect that this worthy man, Robinson, had to his flock and his flock to him, that it might be said of them as it was once said of that famous emperor, Marcus Aurelius, we've talked about Marcus Aurelius before, emperor of Rome, right? Uh, and the people of Rome, that it was hard to judge whether he delighted more in having such a people or they in having such a pastor. His love was great towards them, and his care was always bent for their best good, both for soul and body, for besides his singular abilities and divine things wherein he excelled, he was also very able to give directions in civil affairs and to foresee dangers and inconveniences, by which means he was very helpful to their outward estates, and so was every way as a common father unto them." Now, I don't want to romanticize these guys. Some of this, I think, probably can sound a little bit creepy, right? And uh, certainly if you weren't like all in, if you weren't bought in on the uh, Pilgrim Project, or at this point it's the Separatist Project, um, you know, it, this might feel a little bit intrusive. Um, but if we're going to celebrate Thomas More for his convictions, right, of going to his his death in defense of his belief that um, that Henry VIII was violating the, the, the Catholic Church, um, then we certainly have to admire these guys who are sticking by their guns, who are living out their principles in both a positive and a negative way. That is, they're, they're willing to give over themselves and their lives to this communal life um, and this shared life that they believe is reflected in the Acts of the Apostles, and they're willing to suffer for it. They're willing to leave their home behind and suffer all kinds of difficulties um, just to eke out a life that they can feel confident in, feel, feel comfortable and, and uh, confident in as a, as a moral and godly life. Now, I mentioned that this might not be a super exciting way to live if you hadn't already, like William Bradford, bought into it, if you weren't convicted of it. Um, and indeed, that's a problem that the, the separatists begin to discover in Holland, um, because Holland is a very worldly place. They, they, they arrive on shore, they're, they're sort of overwhelmed, right, by hearing a new language for the first time, many of them, and, um, you know, seeing all the commerce that's going on. And many of their kids uh, start to kind of assimilate, uh, and they fear that they're losing them to the world, essentially. And uh, what they want is, is a kind of really pure, fresh start. That's, you know, why they were accused of being Puritans, right? Um, that they want to sort of cleanse the uh, their communal experience of these temptations of the world, and they don't want to see their kids dragged away from them uh, by the world. Um, and so this is where eventually they gather together, and after much discussion and debate, they make the decision that they're going to go to the new world. Um, and And Bradford recounts in his in his fourth chapter why they do this and all the different reasons, um, including that their kids are starting to assimilate. Um, and then, and this is the part that I want to emphasize as we're talking about, right, this kind of re the religious conviction um, that that founded, in some sense, the American people even before there was the American country, right? Bradford writes, lastly, and which was not least, a great hope and inward zeal they had of laying some good foundation, or at least to make some way thereunto, for the propagating and advancing the gospel of the kingdom of Christ in those remote parts of the world, yea, though they should be but even as stepping stones unto others, for the performing of so great a work. Now, the New World at this time is known of. It's an object of great interest and speculation. Um, plenty of people are going over there for profit. And in a moment, we're going to meet the Plymouth Company uh, who are going over there for profit that are going to basically, you know, be the uh, vehicle for the pilgrims getting over there. Um, but this is another aspect of the New World, right? A kind of blank slate, a kind of blank canvas. Now, of course, as we know, it's not a blank canvas. There are people there. But in the in light of the gospel and in light of Europe, right, um, this is a kind of, you know, it's a new nation unto which to preach the gospel. And that's what he's saying. We want to spread the light of this gospel um, in a place where it's never been. These and some other like reasons moved them to undertake this resolution of their removal and which they afterward prosecuted with so great difficulties as by the sequel will appear. The place they had thoughts on was some of those vast and unpeopled countries of America, which are fruitful and fit for habitation, being devoid of all civil inhabitants, where there are only savage and brutish men, which range up and down little otherwise than the wild beasts of the same. We shouldn't 
Balderize this or feel uncomfortable about it. This, you know, if we had been there, this would be about how we would think about things as well. It's not like we, you know, could teleport back and like explain how, how, you know, great and virtuous we are and how evil and wrong they were. This is how they describe and think of, think of the new world, right? Um, this position being made public and coming to the scanning of all, it raised many variable opinions amongst men and caused many fears and doubts amongst themselves. Some from their reasons and hopes conceived labor to stir up and encourage the rest to undertake and prosecute the same. Others, again, out of their fears, objected against it and sought to divert from it, alleging many things, and those neither unreasonable nor unprobable, as that it was a great design and subject to many unconceivable perils and dangers, as besides the casualties of the sea, which none can be freed from. The length of the voyage was such as the weak bodies of women and other persons worn out with age and travail, and many of them were, could never be able to endure. And yet if they should, the miseries of the land which they should be exposed unto would be too hard to be borne, and likely some or all of them together to consume and utterly ruinate them, for there they should be liable to famine and nakedness and the want in a manner of all things. The change of air, diet, and drinking of water would infect their bodies with sore sicknesses and grievous diseases, and also those which should escape or overcome these difficulties should yet be in continual danger of the savage people who are cruel, barbarous, and most treacherous, being most furious in their rage and merciless where they overcome, not being content only to kill and take away life, but delight to torment men in the most bloody manner that may be, uh, flaying some alive with the shells of fishes, cutting of the members and joints and of others by piecemeal, and broiling on the coals, eat the collops of their flesh in their sight whilst they live with other cruelties horrible to be. Related. Now, say whatever else you will about European uh, atrocities in the New World. This is certainly the case in, in many instances, right? I mean, the, the natives uh, were, of course, receiving all kinds of uh, persecution and having their land taken away. Again, they were already fighting amongst themselves amongst this land, over this land. And now, essentially, another powerful invading tribe was coming over. Um, and the way of doing war in the New World amongst the natives was uh, incredibly violent, as indeed most ways of doing war are, but these, as, as, as Bradford describes them, right? If you're just a kind of a community, if you're not soldiers, if you're not a, a company with kind of economic interests and hopefully, you know, armed guards, um, but you're just a group of like, you know, church people of, of, you know, religious, uh, essentially peaceful folks. Um, this is a terrifying prospect. They're looking seriously and together as a kind of democratic body, uh, at whether it's worth this, um, for the opportunity to, uh, live out what they believe is their God's vision, God's plan for their life. Now here's the answer. It was answered that all great and honorable actions are accompanied with great difficulties and must be both enterprised and overcome with answerable courages. It was granted that dangers were great, but not desperate. The difficulties were many, but not invincible. For though there were many of them likely, yet they were not certain. It might be sundry of the things feared might never befall. Others by provident care and the use of good means might in great measure be prevented. And all of them, through the help of God, by fortitude and patience, might either be born or overcome. True it was that such attempts were not to be made and undertaken without good ground and reason, not rashly or lightly, as many have done for curiosity or hope of gain, etc. But their condition was not ordinary. Their ends were good and honorable, their calling lawful and urgent, and therefore they might expect the blessing of God in their proceeding. Yea, though they should lose their lives in this action, yet might they have comfort in the same, and their endeavors would be honorable. They lived here but as men in exile, and in a poor condition, and as great miseries might possibly befall them in this place, for the twelve years of truce were now out, and there was nothing but beating of drums, and preparing for war, the events whereof are always uncertain. The Spaniard might prove as cruel as the savages of America, and the famine and pestilence as sore here as there, and their liberty less to look out for remedy. After many other particular things answered and alleged on both sides, it was fully concluded by the major part to put this design in execution and to prosecute it by the best means they could. And so gathering together in, in full acknowledgement of the risks, having already suffered uh, terrible hardship on the journey to Holland, which I'm going to talk about in a second, um, they nevertheless decide that, you know, for the sake of their liberty and the honor of their, of their endeavor, they are going to make the trek. People are constantly asking me, 
why is your beard so perfect? And the answer really is mini mustachery. They're one of my oldest sponsors, pals of mine, and they make everything you need to take care of a good beard. There's a lot. There's oils, balms, waxes, beard washes, conditioners. Um, you need good stuff to grow a good beard. And even if you don't want a beard, which, you know, your, your call, although who knows why. Um, no, you, seriously, even if you want to be clean shaven, you need good razors, good aftershaves, shave soaps. It can all be found at Mini Mustachery. It's high quality stuff. It's not like that whatever crappy thing you're just clicking on Instagram or whatever. Um, if you go to minimustachery.com forward slash heretics, that's minimustachery.com forward slash heretics, you will get 25% off your purchase. They come in a bunch of different scents, which is great. I love their sandalwood scent. It's just like the best smell. But if that's not your thing, you can try out a bunch of different ones. Um, and really anything that you get from there is going to be better than 99% of the other stuff on the market. Minimustachery.com forward slash heretics and use the offer code heretics to get 25% off all your favorite beard care products. So the pilgrims are now getting ready to sail on the Mayflower, which was in itself a difficult endeavor. They had to wrangle with various businessmen, some of whom seem to have cheated them and dealt badly with them. Um, but I want to emphasize just what sea travel was, which the pilgrims knew well at this point, because they had already made a difficult sea journey to Holland. Um, and on that way, they had this experience, which I want to talk about before I talk about the Mayflower. So this is their journey to Holland. Here's Bradford's description. Um, the poor men which were got aboard were in great distress for their wives and children, which they saw thus to be taken and were left destitute of their helps and themselves also not having a clothe to shift them with more than they had on their backs and some scarce a penny about them, all they had being aboard the bark. It drew tears from their eyes and anything they had would have given to have been ashore again, but all in vain, there was no remedy. They must thus sadly part and afterward endured a fearful storm at sea being 14 days or more before they arrived at their port, in seven whereof they saw neither sun, moon, nor stars, and were driven near the coast of Norway, the mariners themselves often despairing of life, and once with shrieks and cries gave over all, as if the ship had been foundered in the sea, and they sinking without recovery. But when man's hope and help wholly failed, the Lord's power and mercy appeared in their recovery, for the ship rose again and gave the mariners courage again, to manage her. And if modesty would suffer me, I might declare with what fervent prayers they cried unto the Lord in this great distress, especially some of them, even without any great distraction, when the water ran into their mouths and ears, the mariners cried out, we sink, we sink, they cried, if not with miraculous, yet with a great height or degree of divine faith. Yet, Lord, thou canst save, yet, Lord, thou canst save, with such other expressions as I will forbear upon which the ship did not only recover, but shortly after the violence of the storm began to abate, and the Lord filled their affliction, their afflicted minds with such comforts as everyone cannot understand, and in the end brought them to their desired haven, where the people came flocking, admiring their deliverance, the storm having been so long and sore, in which much hurt had been done, as the master's friends related unto him in their congratulations. So what's happened here is they've sent an advance party ahead, right? The men have gone ahead. They've left their women and children on the shore to come afterward, and they have suffered what looks like death. This is a scene lifted right out of the Aeneid. At the beginning of Virgil's Aeneid, uh, it looks like the ship's going to go down, and Aeneas wishes he had died at Troy. Um, but the pilgrims don't. Let me read this again. They were crying out. The mariners were crying out, we sink, we sink. Um, but the, the pilgrims were crying out, yet, Lord, thou canst save, yet, Lord, thou canst save, with such other expressions. And the storm began to abate, and the Lord filled their afflicted minds with such comfort as everyone cannot understand. Let me compare another scene uh, that is not from pagan literature, that is not from the Aeneid, but rather from the Gospels. This is Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, starting to read at verse 36. And when they had sent away the multitude, that is the disciples, they took him, that is Jesus, even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. So Jesus and his followers in the ship. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? 
And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Remember, this is a highly scriptural community, these pilgrims. And when we read this account of the shipwreck on the way to Holland, or the near shipwreck, rather, on the way to Holland, we can hear the echoes of this of this biblical miracle in the background, right? Um, Yet, Lord, canst thou save? This is a people that has been formed by the gospel and that knows it's true, right? That is willing to put its life on the line, that even in the midst of a storm that looks to the mariners even like they're going to sink, they cry out, Yet, Lord, canst thou save? It's enormously moving. And it's the spirit of the people. It's the spirit of that people that would eventually, you know, generations down the line um, become the American people. You can see it, right? They're not, you know, they're not making distinctions of class and, you know, appointing their peers to the parliament like their uh, forebears. They are gathering together, making these decisions in rough and rugged ways, uh, ready to face what they know to be a life-threatening journey. They've already had this experience on the way to the Netherlands. Now they're going to have potentially the exact same experience on the way to the new world. And in fact, they do. Here's chapter nine of Bradford's account. They have another uh, terrifying experience. Remember that part of the people on this ship, the Mayflower, are the pilgrims, about half of the uh, half of the company, and the rest are what's called strangers, that is entrepreneurs and business people. So folks that are not at all keyed into this, you know, kind of utopian uh, apocalyptic vision that the that the separatists have. So after they had enjoyed fair winds and weather for a season, this is on the Mayflower and out on the way to the New World, they were encountered many times with crosswinds and met with many fierce storms with which the ship was shaken and her upper works made very leaky. And one of the main beams in the midships was bowed and cracked, which put them in some fear that the ship could not be able to perform the voyage. So some of the chief of the company, perceiving the mariners to fear the sufficiency of the ship, as appeared by their mutterings, they entered into serious consultation uh, with him and other officers of the ship to consider in the time of danger and rather to return than to cast themselves into a desperate and inevitable peril. And truly there was a great distraction and difference in opinion amongst the mariners themselves. Fain would they do what could be done for their wages' sake, being now half the seas over. And on the other hand, they were loath to hazard their lives too desperately. So the mariners are ready to turn back here and lose their pay. Um, but in examining all opinions, the master and others affirmed that they knew the ship to be strong and firm under water. And for the buckling of the main beam, there was a great iron screw the passengers brought out of Holland which would raise the beam into his place. So remember I talked about this last year when we talked about Thanksgiving. This is a ship that is basically held together with like sellotape and chewing gum at this point. Um, they set it firm in the lower deck and other ways bound. Um, it would, he would make it sufficient. And as for the deck and upper works, they would caulk them as well as they could. And though with the working of the ship, they would not long keep staunch, yet there would otherwise be no great danger if they did not overpress her with sails. So they committed themselves to the will of God and resolved to proceed. In sundry of these storms, the winds were so fierce and the seas so high as they could not bear a knot of sail, but were forced to hull for diverse days together. And in one of them, as they thus lay at hull, in a mighty storm, a lusty young man called John Howland, coming upon some occasion above the gratings, was with the seal of the ship thrown into the sea. It pleased God that he caught hold of the topsail halyards, which hung over the board and ran out at length. Yet he held his hold, though he was sundry fathoms under water, till he was hauled up by the same rope to the brim of the water, and then with a boat hook and other means, got into the ship again, and his life saved. And though he was something ill with it, yet he lived many years after and became a profitable member both in church and commonwealth. It's unbelievable. I mean, you could just read this thing from cover to cover from start to finish. And it's like one unbelievable story after another suffering that we couldn't imagine taking upon ourselves um, simply in the name of uh, fleeing religious persecution. When I talked a while back about, you know, what do we do to stand up against state persecution? I mean, this is an amazing thing to be willing to do, right? To be willing to stand up, leave your home and then leave a comfortable place. Um, although, of course, the threat of war with Spain is is lowering over Holland. Nevertheless, right, to, to kind of proactively get up and 
face things like this um, is, a, is a, an amazing testament to a religious faith that was real for people, as real as the nose on your face. Um, they get there finally to Plymouth. And there lies before them all the danger and the difficulty that I talked about last year, the main part of the Thanksgiving story that we've talked about before, the harsh winter, um, the encounters with the natives that would eventually sort of save them um, and the, the pact that they would make. Um, but the last thing that I want to talk about here um, before all of that, right, because remember that the Thanksgiving of it all um, is already there, right? There's already on these shores that they give thanks to God um, for what they were able to accomplish um, really only by his hand, right? I mean, only because they uh, prayed to him and, and, and relied on the faith of, the, of those disciples in that boat in Mark chapter four, right? Um, here's, here's what happens when they get there. He says, I shall a little return, what Bradford says, and begin with a combination made by them before they came ashore, being the first foundation of their government in this place, occasioned partly by the discontented and mutinous speeches that some of the strangers amongst them had let fall from them in the ship, that when they came ashore, they would use their own liberty, for none had power to command them. So these are th what he's essentially saying is these, these rough-hewn entrepreneurs, the strangers who are not part of the separatists, not the pilgrims, um, are basically saying, I'm going to do anything. I'm going to be lawless. There's no rules here. It's the new world, right? Um, and that's important because it tells you that that's not who the pilgrims were. They were not anarchists who just thought they should be able to do whatever the hell anybody wanted, right? Um, so they're making this, this compact, this agreement, uh, this written agreement, that that's not how they're going to live their lives. And so they write down this, this document, which is going to set... Uh, bounds, limits to their freedom, even as, in fact, they are here at great pains seeking the freedom to enact their religious beliefs, right? Um, this is called the Mayflower Compact. It's a very famous document in the history of early colonial America. So the form was as followeth. In the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign lord, King James, by the grace of God, of Great Britain, France, and Ireland King, defender of the faith, and having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents, solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one of another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue hereof to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience, in witness whereof we have hereunder subscribed our names at Cape Cod the 11th of November in the year of the reign of our sovereign lord, King James of England, France, and Ireland the 18th, and of Scotland the 54th in the year of our lord, 1620. It's a short little paragraph. Um, and it doesn't seem too consequential until you reflect on what we've been talking about, right? That inspired by this passionate religious faith and by this vision of the early church, these people who have now uh, risked their lives and will risk their lives again, some of them suffering, disease, hardship, starvation, death, these people are committing to govern themselves. They're not bucking the sovereign. They, they profess their loyalty to him, even after he has persecuted them, um, because what they believe is that they are trying to heal in some ways the, the um, corruption of, of their native land, right, by, by striking out and trying something new, right? Um, nevertheless, they undertake to govern themselves in the manner of their church and in the manner they, they believe of the early church, the first Christians. Um, when I talked about what is America, I was talking about the small C constitution. That is not the big C constitution where, where we write down uh, how our government is going to go for all time, the, the ground rules of our government, um, but the small C constitution, which is the makeup, the soul of the political order, and that is the people, right? Um, and this kind of primal document, this, this pre-constitutional document has contained within it that soul, these people, right? The, the resilient, rugged people who would brave anything to live out their faith and to live it out in freedom of conscience and who would do so in self-government and liberty. These are the American people. This is the 
genesis of the American people. And these are the people who still live on this continent, despite whatever horrors are going on at, in our government, whatever level of corruption may, happening, may happen in our big C constitution. Um, this spirit, this small C constitutional spirit of liberty and righteousness still lives in the American people. And you know how I know? Because as of this recording, uh, I watched the people of Virginia stand up, not because they were like dyed in the wool Republicans who have always voted red, um, not because they have some, you know, pre-selected agenda or like a long history of, of you know, fighting for the right, um, but simply because somebody told them McAuliffe, the candidate, the, the Democratic candidate for government or for governor, told them that parents had no right to intervene in the education of their children. And the people of Virginia got together. They were they were banded together in bounds of, of fellowship at a profoundly grassroots level, and they got up and said no, and they flipped the state. Nobody would have predicted that a year ago. They flipped the state because Americans, as my friend Inez Stepman said recently on Twitter, have a genius for self-government. Where's that genius come from? It goes right back to 1620 and the pilgrims and the separatists who simply would not rest until they would live in a wide and free land where they could live out their faith under the auspices of their God. That, as much as, you know, the food that we eat and the uh, celebrations that we have, that, that thanksgiving to that God who gave the strength to those pilgrims is what this day is about. Happy Thanksgiving. Don't let it go. Govern yourself. If y'all are admiring that painting behind me, I do not blame you. It's from Paint Your Life. I sent them, actually my producers sent them, a picture of Chad Cat, my kitten, when he was a little baby. And they recreated this hand-painted, gorgeous reproduction of this cat, which I love, which I will keep forever. Um, you can send them anything. You can send them a place that you loved, a person that's no longer with you, a memory that's really special, um, and they will work with you. They'll sign you up with a professional artist. You can give comments and talk about um, what you want out of this painting. They're great gifts. So if you're experiencing dude panic, where you wake up and you realize you still haven't bought Christmas gifts. Um, this is a great option, great opportunity. Um, text heretics, H-E-R-E-T-I-C-S to 64,000. Um, for this limited time offer, you get 20% off. And there's no risk because if you don't love it, you will get your money back. Now, some terms apply. So go to paintyourlife.com forward slash terms to read them. Um, but I don't think you're going to want your money back. I, I think you're going to love this. Text heretics, H-E-R-E-T-I-C-S to 64,000. That's heretics, to 64,000 to get 20% off a personalized, hand-done painting of your favorite photograph. So here's a mailbag question. One of the benefits of being a VIP is you get to ask mailbag questions. If you try to ask me a mailbag question and you're not a VIP, I will simply scoff at you and say, ha, you do not get to ask me questions. No, I won't scoff at you, but I won't answer either on the show. Um, so here's a mailbag question from Sox Nations. Sox Nations writes, what do you make of the theory that Jesus was an Essene. So this has been a pretty Jesus-y episode. So let's talk about Jesus for a second, and let's talk about the biblical history that's behind this question. Um, Josephus, who is the historian of biblical times from outside of the Bible, essentially, he's, he's a Jewish historian, he tells us about the time of Jesus and thereabouts, right? Um, he gives us this taxonomy of the major sects within Judaism during what was called the Second Temple Period. So the Second Te Temple Period is the period during which Jesus lived. And it's called the Second Temple Period because it's the time when they had to rebuild the temple of God in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, holy city of God, promised to the Jews uh, from for as long as there have been Jews, um, this this was promised to them. They would have a city in, uh, in Israel uh, that the, the Holy Land would be where the seat of God was, the Holy of Holies. Um, then, as we have discussed at length on the show, um, the Babylonian conquest occurred. So Nebuchadnezzar II um, sacks Jerusalem, desecrates the temple in the 6th century BC. It is a catastrophe of inestimable proportions. It's not just a political disaster, though it is that. Um, it's also a crisis of faith, because if this is where God lives, um, and then the temple falls— is God dead? Has he abandoned us? What? I mean, this is a radical change in what the Jews have to be able to think about 
their faith. And, and in, in some sense, there then ensues a centuries long, uh, wrestling with this that includes the prophets, but also the religious leaders like uh, the Essenes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, um, you know, because it's not just Babylon. After they are released by Cyrus of Persia to go back into Jerusalem, um, then there are other persecutions from the Hellenistic uh, kings, right, that, you know, Jerusalem is under constant siege, um, and it just seems as if the the vision, the political vision for Jerusalem's future is is uh, beleaguered and, and confusing and nobody can quite understand what's going on. So th th there's a centuries-long argument um, in the Second Temple period after they reoccupy Jerusalem, build the temple back up um, over just what this is about. Now, for Christians, the answer to that centuries-long argument comes when Jesus says, uh, you shall worship God in spirit and truth. Um, God is spirit, and he does not live on any one mountain. You worship him um, all over the world, right? This is this radical new Christian understanding that kind of answers this question for Christians. Um, but for Jews, it's still a live question during this time and, and uh, you know, goes on after that. And the people who are kind of fighting for uh, leadership um, during the Second Temple period are the these, these sects that we sometimes just think of in the, the Bible, we think of them as all one, right? The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're all the same person. Um, they're just, you know, they're, they're kind of the bad guys. Um, but that's really wrong, actually. They, they are, um, you know, respectable priestly classes of people who are trying to figure out how, sh how should we live. Um, the Pharisees believe in all sorts of rules that are not in the Torah, the kind of unwritten Torah, which would eventually gradually become the Talmud. Um, the Sadducees are just the first five books of the Bible, just the Torah. So they don't believe, for example, in bodily resurrection. The Bible says they denied bodily resurrection. Um, and they were kind of the less popular of the two, actually. The Pharisees were um, more liked among the people. And in some ways, what Jesus is doing, he's coming in and saying, you know, you guys are arguing over should we have these rules or those rules, and I'm going to blow your mind and say it's something completely different altogether, right? It's cutting through uh, the whole thing uh, and saying, you know, so, so in that sense, Jesus is a man apart. He is his own. He is God. Um, and, and he is not actually, you know, representing the victory of any one sect. Um, but the Essenes, who are like the third sect, um, are interesting because they kind of look like they might be related to some of the stuff that Jesus uh, is is into. Now, I don't think that Jesus was an Essene because, for one thing, they, they also denied the resurrection of the body. Um, but some of this stuff, uh, it seems as if perhaps uh, John the Baptist, for example, um, who seems to have kind of taught Jesus or been his mentor in, in Jesus' earthly life on earth, um, may have been kind of related to the Essenes or, or, or practiced some of their teachings. They were very ascetic, you know, they, um, and this thing where John wears ca uh, camel hairs and eats locusts and honey, right? Um, John might arise out of that tradition. And in some ways, I kind of think of this as like when Isaiah says, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And then the gospels cite that passage when they talk about John, right? It's like this whole thing from Babylon on through the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and then up to the Essenes out in the desert, right? These ascetics, um, the whole thing is preparing the way for Jesus to intervene. It's like the, the argument has reached exactly the right point uh, for Jesus to say, you shall not worship uh, in any one place, but in spirit and in truth, for God is spirit and truth. We think of that as kind of obvious. God is everywhere. God is omnipotent. He's omnipresent. Um, but it was an, a, a mind-blowing thing for him to say that he's in this room, and no matter what temples fall, no matter what politics happen, um, no matter what nation crumbles to dust, right? Nevertheless, God is not conquered, but goes with you into exile um, as he goes with you everywhere. That's it from me. Hope that's a helpful answer. One more time, go to youngheretics.com forward slash locals if you want to get answers to questions like this um, and many other things, including live stream Q&As and uh, essays that I write exclusively for locals VIPs. Um, I would love to see you there. All right, folks, that's it. Uh, if you like this show, you will love the Claremont Institute where I work. We are an institute for the recovery and defense of the American idea. Uh, I believe our work is incredibly important and I, you can donate to it by going to claremont.org slash donate. Mention in the notes, if you will, that you heard about Claremont through Young Heretics and uh, check out our publications. We have the Claremont Review of Books uh, and the American Mind, both, I think, 
essential reading, in my humble opinion, although I'm an editor at both, so perhaps I'm biased. Um, but I do think they're both great. And actually, I have an essay out in the latest CRB about translating the Bible that folks who listen to this show might really enjoy and, and find interesting. Thanks, as always, for being with me. Happy Thanksgiving. I will see you next week for more truth, beauty, and the stuff that matters.